Hello, it's Sarah from Hardcover Hearts, and I am delighted to be back with you after a little reprieve to heal. Uh, thank you so much for everyone who sent well wishes. Uh, hopefully you saw the community post, the first community post I ever, I ever did. I didn't even know how to use that function, so uh, very happy to have had that. Um, I had a little tumble on a walk uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, as as one does, I landed square on my face and had some severe bruising and wounds that needed time to heal. And with the power of makeup and time to heal, I'm, I'm back. So let's get started with the week of reading or weeks of reading as it were. Uh, this is where I talk about the books that I read, what I'm currently reading and uh, potentially could read next week based on my mood. So the first week after the accident, I really didn't get very much of anything read because I had a lot of headaches with uh, after the fall and, and hitting my hitting my head or my face. So that really restricted what I was able to to read. Uh, I did watch a lot of television, and um, but unfortunately not any K dramas because you have to read them, or at least I do because I don't speak Korean. So. Uh, but let me ta tell you a little bit about what I've read since uh, starting to recover. So the third, first thing that I completed with my delightful buddy regroup was The Female Quixote by Charlotte Lennox. And this is also called The Adventures of Arabella. Uh, this is a, an absolutely delightful romp. It's really silly and funny. And our premise is that we've got Arabella and she is has been kind of led a sheltered life and has been educated to a certain point, found her mother's French romances and didn't really know the difference between the French romances and real life. And so she's conducting herself as if she is in a French romance of the time. Now this was written in 1752. And so her entire sense of morality, justice, decorum, all of that is based on uh, earlier French romances. And so she's completely out of place, completely makes a fool of herself. Uh, and she has a trusted sidekick in her lady's maid. And the types of things that she gets into, the types of things that, ways that she misperceives certain events and certain things and certain encounters is absolutely hilarious. Uh, and uh, you end up laughing at and with her, but she's a really strong character. And she's very, very thoughtful, very intelligent, although uh, misguided. And just loved this, loved reading this with a group of, of people. And so thank you all for those of you who participated in this group read. Uh, the next thing that I read uh, was an audiobook. So I found my way back into audiobooks, thank goodness. It had been a long time since I had listened to one because uh, I, I used to use it in, in my commute, as a lot of people do, and because I haven't left the house. <laughs> Hence, no commute, no, no audiobooks. But I have missed the opportunity of, of just kind of um, delighting in a, a calm story being told to you. So I so I have been trolling my library and looking for some audiobooks. This one came up. I've heard some things about it, so I thought I would check it out. It's Long Bright River by Liz Moore. So the setup of this book is that we have a beat detective, and she lives in Philly. There, She had a hard scrap upbringing, and her sister is missing. And she has a very, very difficult uh, push-pull relationship with her sister. And her sister has fallen on incredibly hard times and turned to drugs and prostitution. And she is, our main character is trying to rise through, through the ranks and prove herself in her role as a beat cop uh, and doesn't want to admit that she's really looking for her sister. So she's trying to do it outside of, of her normal beat. And she doesn't want a lot of her of her co-workers to know that she has a sister who's run afoul of the law and who is missing. And so she sets up an investigation on her own to find her sister at the same time that women are turning up dead and women who are, have been uh, working on the same streets. So she's very afraid that her sister's gonna fall into the same clutches. Uh, it was suspenseful, it was 
it was good for that type of thrillery uh, book, which I don't usually like. Uh, but it was it was pretty it, it was pretty predictable, and I don't think it was fundamentally. I didn't think it was anything that special. Uh, a good, perfect thing if you just want an audio book to kind of keep you engaged as you're doing other things. I think I think it it served that need well. The next book that I that I got uh, this is uh, gave me the opportunity to read one of the first books I ever got when I went to first time to London, and this is one of the Virago Forty for the fortieth. Edition, the Virago Modern Classics. This is the first book they ever published, which is Frost in May by Antonia White. Now, the reason I was ex- excited about this, number one, the first Virago Modern Classic, very exciting, but also my newest favorite podcast, uh, which is called Backlisted, I've talked about it before, uh, they had an entire episode on this. And so I thought, oh, great, let me read this to be ready for the episode. So in this book, we have our main character, Nanda Gray, and she is a young girl who is being sent to a religious school. And this school is really in a convent and it really preps women, young girls, for convent life to enter enter into the nunnery. And what this book does exceedingly well is provide that very stifling feeling of not just a boarding school, but a religious boarding school and all of the uh, heated excitement and romanticism that comes at that age from thinking about religion and all of the the sacrifice and all the things that have to happen and the rituals um, and how a young girl gets really excited by all of that. And at the same time, we're able to look at the construct of this type of training for a young girl and how they're really trying, they admit that they're trying to break these young girls' spirits. They don't let any girls form strong attachments. And so they're constantly reorganizing and resetting up little little pods so that girls don't form special friendships. Uh, and we all know special friendships could be um, could be a way to prevent uh, lesbianism in this in this school or in their in their minds. Uh, but it's it's we we're following it through the eyes of Nanda and her innocence, but at the same time her questions and and her passions and her loves and her and how she tries to rebel. I, I, it was magnificent. I thought it was so beautiful. And the conversation that happens on back, Backlisted was also exceptional. Highly, highly recommend it. Then maybe one of my favorite books of the year. Uh, for me, I know Shawnee would not like me to say this uh, from Pastory Time, but this might be a perfect book for me. Uh, this I did a buddy read with Judy Brown, a commenter frequently on this channel and others. And we read Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell together. Oh, this book. Uh, So what did I love about it? Uh, This book is the story of Shakespeare's wife uh, and how they they came together, uh, their families, uh, their circumstances, and then the up up to and past the death of their son, Hamnet, who he then uses... uh, in, in as the famous play name, Hamlet. Uh, the book, the writing was so good. I was already predisposed to loving this. It's a historical fiction written by a, a well-known writer of literary fiction, it's focused on a woman named Agnes who has some kind of witchy characteristics and very strong independence. So it, it was already going into it. I thought this was going to be strong, and it it absolutely was for me. Uh, Agnes as a character is remarkable. Uh, I loved her. I loved uh, the 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 family. I loved her children. Uh, the scenes, uh, how she wrote the scenes, where I still see them in my head. Very visual, very visceral writing. Uh, some nature writing in there. Uh, and the story and the plot, I thought, was fantastic. Uh, so for me, this this was just an exceptional, exceptional read. And I really hope it wins the Women's Prize. I still have some other books that I need to read uh, to kind of catch up. But this is such a strong contender, uh, such a strong contender. So this was a delightful, uh, delightful book. 
uh, can't, can't speak more highly of it. Then switching gears, um, as part of my anti-racism work for myself personally, I'm trying to understand more deeply the, um, the theory of abolition, prison abolition and, and defunding police forces. Like what is it in practice? Um, I think I understand why the need, but what does it look like? Uh, what is the vision? And then how is, how do we, how do we tactically get there? Are prisons obsolete by Angela Davis? This book was a magnificent, such a great primer, uh, really, on how to think about prisons and and how they've come into play. How they, what did we think about uh, imprisonment before? Which, in essence, it was just a holding pen till the real punishment happened. It itself was not the punishment. Uh, she talked about how uh, Charles. Dickens came to the United States to see one of the first prisons set up and said that it was actually inhumane and it was worse than than some of the some of, of the death penalty that was in England at the time or some of the physical punishments where it happens and then you go back to society and you live your life. But the idea of imprisoning people forever um, is anathema to what we think should think of in terms of restorative justice. And knowing that even a pris even someone who's a murderer will probably get out in about seven to 14 years. What happens then? And what justice has been given to the, to the victim's families? What does that look like? What should it look like? What could it look like if we rethink what, what the, the role that prison plays in our society? Uh, this was incredibly easy to read, uh, engaging, thought-provoking, and I highly recommend it and looking forward to reading more of Angela Davis's work. Then I had a buddy read. Uh, ironically, I had a buddy read and we were going to read uh, To Calais in, Re in Ordinary Time, which was a complete dud. Uh, so I was reading this with Eric Carl Anderson, and we were both looking forward to it. Both of us love historical fiction, thought this would be a good win. And it was such a slog, and there were so many terrifying, horrible, horrible characters uh, that we were meeting, and we were going to have to take a trip with them <laughs> through the entire book. And I, we both just said no, thank you. So we, but we wanted to read together because I would have been meeting um, Eric Carl Anderson in London around this time uh, if. COVID hadn't happened. So we decided to switch gears and we, and the announcement for uh, the pro, one of the prizes, the Walter Scott, I think, prize uh, came out and it was The Narrow Land by Christine Dwyer Hickey. And this is a book that was so good and it was right in our wheelhouse, uh, I think for both of us. It's about Edward Hopper and his wife, and they had a very tempestuous, very challenging, antagonistic relationship. Uh, and it's the story of a summer that they that they're in in Cape Cod, it, it, where they where they lived and would go for the summer, and the introduction of this young boy who is an orphan, who was brought over after World War II, and has been adopted by a family. And he is uh, sent away to be to be with a a friend, kind of a summer a summer reprieve at the beach with a kid that he doesn't really know, um, but as almost a an opportunity for him to get away and an opportunity for his his adopted family to move and set up home. They're expecting their first biological child, and they want to get ready without without our main character, uh, Michael, there. And we see all, door, all different shades of loneliness and different uh, aspects of it through all of these different characters that we meet in this book. But it's told from this kind of, a little bit of a distance is, is place. And so you do feel like you're observing something as opposed to in, integrated in with it at first. And I think the more you meet these characters and the more you learn about the characters, it, it evolves and you start to get a bigger picture and you go deeper into who these people are. 
I thought it was a magnificent read. I I really, really enjoyed it. And I think it's worthy of, of the win. So well, well done her. Okay, the next book. Uh, so I had such a great experience in getting back to, to audiobooks. So I wanted to maintain that momentum. And for me, uh, an easy pick is always a mystery. Uh, I decided to look up the next of the Inspector Lindley series because I enjoyed the first one so much. So number two is called Payment in Blood. And this is by, uh, by Elizabeth George. What I love about this series is that class is up front and center between the two main characters. We've got, uh, we've got Inspector Lindley and then we have his partner. Now she is of, of lower class and is, is always painfully aware of how her circumstances prevent her from moving forward as a woman, as a woman of lower class, um, who doesn't have the Eaton education, who doesn't have the connections, uh, and who also physically is not beautiful and attractive and able to use that to, to get to her advantage. And then we have Lindley, who is gorgeous and uh, erudite and so smart and has an eaten education and knows all the people and is in that in that set. And because of that, it's always at play. And I think that's the most fascinating part of of how this is always explored in this in the books. And in this case, there is a murder that happens in Scotland and the 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 police force uses Lindley at, to go in there because it is of the upper set, and his partner is there, and she sees what's happening, and she is, and because it's so clear to her, and it's what happens there, and how does she, and how does she still try to be professional, but also understand that there's dynamics and politics at play. Uh, with who they're choosing to talk to, who they're choosing to look at for this crime. Really great uh, and enjoyed it, gave it a four star. Then the next is a completely different thing for me. Uh, I started reading some some graphic novels in French because I'm trying to start uh, building my French up again. And as I was looking for graphic novels, I found this. Uh, this is The Tea Dragon Society. Uh, this is the first of, of a series. And I've seen this on a few people's channels. I think Celia loved it. I think uh, Sean has mentioned it. I think even, even Heather has mentioned it. I'll mention all of their channels below. Uh, and so I immediately borrowed it and it was just joy. It was, it was so effervescent and delightful and heartwarming. And the, the, the visuals are so beautiful. The, the art is gorgeous. And the message is just heartwarming and lovely. Uh, and I, I was so happy to have read it and looking forward to reading the second one. And then last on my, on my list, oh, and that was by uh, Kate O'Neill. The last on my list uh, is Weather. And this is by Jenny Awful. Uh, I can't speak too much about it because I have my in real life book club meeting this evening, uh, but I read it as part of our readings of uh, of the Booker Inter uh, or I think the Women's Prize, I think is what we're reading that one for. We're reading it for one of the prizes. I don't, they're all starting to come together. Uh, so we're gonna be talking about that this evening. Stay tuned, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an update later on that. Then what am I currently reading? So finishing up The Romance of the Forest by Anne Radcliffe. So this is the fourth and last of my, if, my uh, series that I've been doing of, of group reads on 18th century women novelists. This is a gothic, uh, a gothic story, a lot of nature writing, uh, a lot of mystery, a lot of suspense, fantastic uh, character uh, as our main character. It's set in France and Switzerland. There's adventure. Uh, we were joking that Adeline, uh, the, the main protagonist of this story, is living the life that our previous uh, character, Arabella, really wishes that, that she could live. This is the this is all the adventure is found here, as opposed to just in Arabella's mind. 
So this is just a really great, really great way to wrap up this this series. And I'm thrilled to have had some some partners with me along in the journey and making a group read really, really fun and exciting. So we're finishing this up this week. Uh, then I received an arc for the next Anthony uh, Horowitz book. Uh, this is the second of the Magpie Murder, what's turning into a series called Moonflower Murders. And I'm not sure if you've ever read the Magpie Murders, but it's like uh, it's like a Russian nesting doll of a puzzle. There's a book inside a book, so it's with publishing, and uh, it's it almost feels very meta. Well, the same thing is true in the in the Moonflower Murders. We have the same main character uh, who was um, an editor, a, publish, a publishing editor, and she is called in to get some help because. Her previous novelist that was in the Magpie Murders, who has passed away, wrote a story about a murder that actually happened, and they think a clue is in there to solve that murder. And a woman who, the woman who discovered it is now missing. And so they brought her from a, a, a romance that she's having in Crete, where she's left the publishing industry. She said, that's it, I'm done with these people. And she's gone off to Crete with her lover and opened a, a hotel. Uh, all of a sudden, she's getting pulled back to London uh, to, so, to help solve this crime, even though she is not a detective. But she knows her, her author so well and knows that book that maybe she can help find this missing woman. Already, it's a romp. It's so it's delightful. I really love The Magpie Murder, so I'm having fun with this. I'm about 60% done. Uh, so we'll look forward to uh, telling you more next week on that. Then my next audiobook that I'm listening to is also a continuation. I haven't I haven't continued any Donna Leon lately, and so wanted to go into the second book of her of her Commissario Brunetti series, and this is Death in a Strange Country. These are all set in Venice, and in this one we have a, an American. Uh, who is found murdered. And uh, he, and so uh, Comsario Brunetti has to figure out well, why is this Amer why was this American murdered and also deal with the politics of the American naval base that's nearby and trying to uh, figure out how to finesse the, his his investigation at the same time uh, not getting in the way of the American uh, politics uh, that are in play. So that's fun. And uh, just started that. So uh, I'm not very far into that. Then next week, I have a few buddy reads. But most importantly, I have the entire week off. So the week that I would have been in Oxford is completely free. Uh, so I am planning to actually go out, meet up with some friends and do some social distancing and also to do some reading, some really hardcore reading. I have a few things teed up and some buddy reads that I'm starting. I'll talk more about them later because this video is already so long. And uh, most importantly, I'm just so happy to be back and thank you all for the great messages. I also need to catch up on a few of the tags that I've been tagged in and then also do some watching of BookTube because I haven't been able to do that either in catching up with my real life job work. So uh, stay tuned for more and I look forward to talking to you later. Please be safe, uh, social distance, uh, wash your hands and don't touch your face. Thank you so much and I look forward to talking to you later. Bye.